Live from Palo Alto, in the heart of Silicon Valley, it's theCUBE, covering I.O. Brought to you by I.O. Now, here are your hosts, John Furrier and Peter Burris. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are live in Silicon Valley. This is theCUBE for a special broadcast with IO Conversations, an event here on Sand Hill Road in Silicon Valley at the Rosewood Hotel, talking about data centers of service. I'm John Furrier with Peter Burris, head of research for Silicon Angle Media, also general manager of Wikibon Research. And our next guest is Jabez Tan, structure research analyst. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you guys. All right, now you get to break it all down. What's going on in this hosting, Rackspace went private, Amazon's killing it in the cloud, mm -hmm. enterprise customers is looking for cloud-like infrastructure. Mm -hmm. We talked about power earlier being a, <laughs> a, a design factor. Data at the center of the value proposition. What's, what's, the, what's the research show? What's the landscape look like? Yeah, no, great question. I think um, it really is summed up by you know, data center assets that used to be operated by enterprises on premise are starting to be outsourced into data center providers that are, that's their core competency, which is operating, owning, and you know, deploying data center capacity. So what we're seeing from the cloud and data center side is that because because of the growth in the what we call the massive scale cloud providers, so the Amazons, the Microsoft Azures, the Google Compute, the Alibabas of the world, that's really driving a lot of demand for data center capacity. And the reason, you know, on one end it's driving demand, uh, uh, driving growth on the data center side. On the other hand, you're seeing it cannibalize a lot of the growth from the traditional hosting providers, so the shared hosters, the dedicated hosters, the managed hosting providers. A lot of companies now, with especially the startup community in Silicon Valley, um, they they're not jumping into, they're not going through the traditional kind of process or routes. They don't go from shared hosting to dedicated servers and then kind of migrate from there. They're just skipping straight to the cloud. And then you're seeing, as you, then and you're kind of reflecting that on the on the total growth of Amazon. And so what companies have been doing now is pivoting to the, to the point of where they're saying, okay, we can't really compete um, on economies of scale with Amazon and Microsoft and Google. But what we can do is we can build a, almost like a, a management and orchestration layer on top of Azure, on top of AWS, and say to the customer, hey, you, you may not have the, the competency or, or the know-how to architect and operate an AWS deployment, but we know how to do that. Let us, let us take care of that relationship for you. And they're, you know, in essence, they're reselling AWS, but they're adding their own flavor of what they call managed services. And for Rackspace, like you mentioned, they, they, they built their business on this concept of fanatical support. So really adding that fanatical support layer on top of um, that massive scale public cloud. This reseller is the second time I heard that. We also heard the first kind of inkling of it at VMworld when VMware kind of got out of the cloud and people were saying, hey, they should just resell mm -hmm. other people's cloud and they got the vCloud Air Network. So obviously the trend is where do people fit in? So the industry vendors that provide this, the resources have that dynamic. And the other one I'd like to get your thoughts on is the global aspect, you mentioned Alibaba, right? So mm -hmm. you're seeing the regional deployments of data centers, obviously the cloud providers. Yeah. How does that all shake out in the, into the landscape, the global impact? Yeah, and I think you're seeing, um, you know, companies like Alibaba, where they've traditionally focused on the Chinese market, they're growing so fast and they're getting a lot of international traction that they're starting to expand outside of China. So you're seeing uh, a wave of kind of Chinese companies, we call them BATs, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent. Uh, they're really starting to really kick the tires on internet, international expansion and they're expanding outside to Hong Kong, to Singapore, to Southeast Asia, to Australia, and all the way, all the way to the US West Coast where we're seeing the, you know, pretty large deployments from these guys. Uh, so that's kind of, I think you're seeing the genesis of a lot of these companies that have built their businesses on the cloud, and that's really resonating with the new wave of, of businesses that are entering the market. A lot of it is built and architected to take advantage of the cloud. And the beauty of that is because um, you're not having to deal with legacy infrastructure anymore. It's, 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 this, it's this kind of gradual and conservative shift from a CapEx heavy model where you own all these assets, you own all these buildings, to a CapEx, CapEx light model where it's all about pay as you go. I want I only pay as much as I use, and that's, I think, the allure of the cloud. I think uh, why you see companies like an Uber a get around a Lyft. You know, they, that's why they have been so successful. And Airbnb, it's because they're really leveraging on that model of you know pulling resources together and optimizing it and 
and also delivering it in a platform that makes sense and seamless for the for the end user. And the cloud native trend, you mentioned the Silicon Valley starts skipping right to the cloud, also called mm -hmm. cloud natives. Interesting. Um, with that in mind, are you seeing anything on your radar on the research side that talks about the inter-cloud trend? Because we're seeing a lot of the big traditional vendors like VMware, EMC, HP, and whatnot, trying to find a management orchestration layer, as you pointed out. Mm -hmm. But there's a new dynamic around the inter-clouding, and it's a lot to do with like latency, right? Mm -hmm. So like, that's app workload related. So are you starting to see that conversation in your research, or is it just simply still a, a horsepower, you know, economic model? What's what's your status on that? Yeah, I think latency is a big issue. Performance is definitely a key component of every driver when they choose to make a decision. Where do where do we deploy our infrastructure? Who do we deploy with? Uh, they're always looking at how does that latency affect, uh, you know, from from the from the point of our end their end users. How how does that affect the the end user experience? Uh, so I think latency is one factor, and then another factor that you're seeing globally is um, data sovereignty. So having data house in country or within a certain region, um, it's also a big factor in, in data. Mean locale, mean locale. have a locale issue. Yes. That's a tough one, balancing locale with performance around latency, because then you lose locale if you go for the latency. It's interesting. Are we going to, how many, how many net buyers of technology will there be? in 20 years? Ooh, that's a very, very broad question. And, you know, I mean, I guess the simple answer is I, we don't know. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's such a, I mean, the reason why I think that you're seeing a lot of new companies um, enter the business as well as consolidation happening at the same time is that it speaks to the diversity of workloads that you're seeing coming out from the enterprise, from the SMEs, the SMBs. Um, and, then, uh, and then from that, you're splitting it by vertical. So the financial services vertical requires a certain type of specification, certain type of service versus the oil and gas, versus the uh, e-commerce sector. So I think because there's so much diversity in, in terms of the workloads and applications and the requirements that each of these companies have, that you're going to see, a, 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 you're still going to see a large pool of IT buyers, I teach you know, strategic decision makers. I think in you know five ten years ago, someone was saying that you know in ten years you're going to see two providers, you know one one big cloud provider and one big data center provider. Um, and I don't think you, we we've seen that resonate so far. I mean, we're yeah. continually seeing so much diversity. I don't agree with that. I think it's yeah. not going to be a winner take all. I think it's going to be a lot of different players. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I guess my question would be for you on your on your research is, um, generally speaking, the internet has always been about connecting, right? So like the old Days. You provision a circuit to a building, and then you connect to the internet, and you have some security, maybe VPN, whatnot. These things are, are, are normal. But the question is, is the current internet infrastructure, global infrastructure, good enough to handle cloud at scale? If you have Google doing their thing, you have Amazon doing their they're building their own clouds, if you will. Is the general other infrastructure even good enough? around security, around latency, around just providing kind of the, the needs? Yeah, I would say the answer is both yes and no. And I think that's very market specific. So for Asia, for example, where we've done a lot of our research on, uh, if, you, you, if you compare a market like Singapore to a market like Indonesia or India, I mean, it's night and day, the infrastructure quality, the connectivity, the robustness of infrastructure, the ease of doing business, the political climate. I mean, you name it, there's so many factors that tie into um, deploying and operating a business in, in very various regions of the world. I mean, the U.S. market, we're very privileged to be in a roughly homogenous, you know, regulation zone where, you know, where you go from California to Vegas to to the East Coast. I mean, you're, it's it's generally governed by the same federal laws, whereas in Asia, you're, you're dealing with completely different governments, completely different languages, cultures, and so it's, I would say, um, infrastructure quality to, like you said, deploy these sophisticated cloud workloads, I would say it varies on a market-by-market -market basis with, obviously, the U.S. US being, I think, one of the most mature, the, the most mature region in the world in terms of adoption, in terms of maturity. Um, and, and that's interesting because uh, markets like Asia, where you know some people are saying they're maybe two to three years, maybe five years behind the U.S., they're looking at what's going on in the U.S. and thinking, okay, how do we adapt to what what's coming out of the U.S.? And so, 
In the U.S., the, the, the trend has been, you know, we went from shared hosting, dedicated servers, VPS, you know, co-location and cloud. Whereas in Asia, they're just jumping straight from on-premise straight to the public cloud. I mean, they, they're skipping all these intermediate steps because they're seeing the growth coming out from the U.S., the level of innovation, and they're thinking, we're going to adapt to this new wave of technology coming out from the U.S. And they have demand, too, so that's a big driver, too, on that side, with exactly. this overall connection. So is that the biggest um, uh, way to explain the difference between Asia-Pacific and the rest of the world? is just more cutting edge cloud or or how would you describe the difference between APAC, Asia Pacific, and then the rest of the world relative to cloud and, and, uh, and on-prem? Yeah, I think that's closely tied to mobile adoption and you know the, the level and the rate at which a lot of these emerging third world countries are starting to really adopt you know smartphones, uh, internet, you know, when you go to what was what we call emerging markets such as Thailand, such as Laos, such as um, Bangkok, and th those markets are still very young in terms of the level of infrastructure quality, uh, the level of development, and so you don't see a lot of growth from these markets yet. But you know, there's always the potential uh, when 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 the population gets more and more savvy on the tech side. Uh, but markets in Singapore, Tokyo, Sydney, Hong Kong—I mean, those are very very mature markets with mobile adoption rates north of 100 percent. So. Uh, I think you're, you're seeing Asia as this kind of wild, wild west almost, that it's where a lot of these, a lot of companies like IO, for example, are, are making a bet on Asia. Goldman Sachs is making a bet on Asia because they're seeing it as a, that new wave of growth, whereas mature markets, growth has relatively hit a point where it's predictable. I mean, it's very transparent, and, and you know, r frankly, I think companies are always searching for new avenues of growth and a, big o a much bigger and much larger addressable market. Is the especially the Chinese market, but is, are Asian markets as conducive to sharing data as they are to sharing technology? That's a great question, um, and you mentioned China because China has been, you know, kind of the elephant in the room in Asia. You can't talk about Asia without talking about China, and I think everyone has um, their their views on China. They, everyone has expressed the challenges of doing business in China because of the way the government regulations are. It's a very closed market. Um, so a lot of our our research, a lot of our time is spent focusing on, okay, China is China's big, China is growing, um, and it's tough to get in. People have said that, but what about the growth coming out of China? What about these companies that are you know, growing too fast to, to really contain within mainland China itself. And, you know, companies like, you know, for example, WeChat, um, you know, they're, they're just starting to kick their tires on global expansions. And, and it's really how can Asia as a whole, as a region outside of China, better prepare themselves and better, better adapt to um, all this kind of growth coming out of that, that mainland market. So you don't think it's going to be as, uh, you don't think it's going to be much of a constraint? You think that the adoption of how data is used and intellectual property is going to be conducive to growth? Yeah, I think uh, for, mark, for open markets like Singapore, Hong Kong, Sydney, Tokyo, I mean, those are mature technology markets, and, and my experience in those markets have been there's still a level of of closed, closed uh, perspective where it's a bit closed, not as open and transparent as the U.S., where you, you're seeing a lot of U.S. companies really partner and collaborate here. But in, in Asia, it's kind of, they, they still have their inhibitions, right? They, they still have a, a legacy mindset of, okay, this is my company, this is what we do, we're going to protect our mindset. And also in Asia, you tend to see more of these um, providers that are kind of a one-stop shop for everything. They do hosting, they do design, they do um, kind of everything. Whereas in the U.S., it's more, you know, you get more specialty firms. You know, like an I.O., we only do uh, co-location and data centers, and we do it really well. Um, and, and, you know, in Asia, you have companies like telcos that do everything. They do everything from SMB, telephone, VoIP, to all the way up to co-location managed hosting cloud. So, What is the I.O. IO data center story? What are, what are those guys doing right now? Could you take a minute to describe their strategy, what their approach is, their differentiation, and their value proposition? Yeah, absolutely. I can speak to kind of what I know um, from, from my time spent with IO. I've, I've primarily spent a lot of time with IO in Singapore because we've done deep dives into the Singapore market. Um, and I think with, with a lot of international expansion coming out from the U.S., that's generally customer driven. And so the, 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 the main driver for IO deploying in Singapore is driven by its one of its key customers, which is Goldman Sachs. Uh, I think it's 
it's publicly disclosed yeah. information. So um, I think that's the way that a lot of firms have um, attempted to enter Asia is by following a strategic customer over and then growing from that base from then on. I think IO is, is a really interesting data center company in the sense that it's able to uh, marry both the software side and the physical asset and, and make it work seamlessly as one. And so you have the IO modules, which is in itself is it's kind of a revolutionary concept for the data center industry that's used to traditional real estate, raised floors, high ceilings, you know, the traditional yeah. structure, whereas IO came into the market saying, hey, we, we don't need that type of design. We're bringing prefabricated modules. I mean, quality control is, is there because it's all prefabricated in the factory and shipped to the customer, so you don't have to worry about a ton of moving pieces. So from that standpoint, I think that, that's where you see a lot of the efficiency that IO brings to the market. Um, and then on top of that, I mentioned the software layer, which is the IO kind of OS, right? Their DCIM, uh, data center infrastructure management tool that, that it's layered on top of their physical asset. And I think that that really gives the, the customer a, a sense of, okay, what's happening within that, that module of mine? What's the power consumption like? How much power am I actually drawing? Am I fully utilizing my asset? And so th that that type of transparency really resonates, I think, with the customer base. I think it's been a big driver of why IO has been, I think, so successful both um, locally and, and internationally. Chavis, thanks so much for spending the time here to come on theCUBE. I'll give you the final word. Share uh, your thoughts on the biggest changes that are going to be happening over the next year or so in your mind uh, on a global scale relative to you know, hosting, data center on premise, and the prospects of cloud. Yeah, I would say the biggest, the biggest um, takeaway I would, I would say is can the public clouds continue to grow at the, the rate and the pace they're growing at? I think AWS is growing at a $10 billion annual run rate pace. Um, can that pace continue? Because a lot of the growth in data center space has been coming from these, you know, top four providers, you know, Oracle, AWS, Azure, um, Google Compute. And so if what, 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 what would happen if the public cloud slows down or there's something, some security issue that, that inhibits growth, I think um, it'll be something to watch going forward. And also looking at also one thing to keep in, in mind is the ecosystem that's developing around the public clouds and how that's evolving the way IT is being consumed and delivered. Um, IT is a service. Thanks so much for spending the insight. This is theCUBE live on, at the Rosewood Hotel Hotel in Silicon Valley on Sand Hill Road. This is theCUBE special presentation with IO Conversations. Data Center as a Service event here at the Rosewood. We'll be back with more after the short break. Hi, I'm John Furrier, the co founder of Silicon Valley.